full 50-minute discussion. I want to welcome everybody this afternoon to uh, a panel discussion entitled Facilitating the Global Dialogue on GMOs. Um, I, I would assume most of you in the room realize that GMOs is a controversial subject. That might be uh, an understatement. Um, but we're lucky enough at Cornell to have uh, three individuals from three different countries around the world in the developing world that can give us a different perspective or give us their perspective on that GMO debate. What's going on in their countries? Um, how does that fit in with the global debate? And, and also how Cornell, people at Cornell might be able to get engaged in that debate. So my name is Greg Jaffe. I'm the director of the Biotechnology Project at the Cent Center for Science and the Public Interest. That's a nonprofit consumer organization located in Washington, D.C. And I'm going to moderate this panel. And what I'm going to do is ask each of the panelists to briefly introduce themselves to you for a minute. I, you probably read their bios uh, in the materials when this was advertised. But I'm, I'm, just to refresh everybody's recollection, I'm going to ask them to each briefly describe uh, who they are, what country they're from, and, and what do they do in that country. So we'll start over with Guido on the far end there. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. My name is Guido Nunez Mujica. I am a computational biologist from Venezuela. Um, currently I'm living in the States, but I'm still very involved with all the political situation. And I am here at the Alliance for Science course because I'm extremely concerned about the agricultural situation of my country. Uh, GMOs have been banned uh, recently, but they have, there have been a moratorium for the last uh, decade or so. And uh, when you see Venezuela, what's going on, all the food prices, you realize that while the position, irrational position to GMOs is a problem, it's a symptom of a larger problem, which is making public policies uh, not based on facts, but on ideology and dogma. Thank you. Hello, and my name is Tamanda Chaputa. I am from Malawi. I work as a communications officer for the National Smallholder Farmers Association of Malawi, whereby I develop communication materials for smallholder farmers who make up the majority of farmers in Malawi. Malawi is hugely dependent on agriculture as such. Uh, this has also spurred the debate on GMOs and how technology can be incorporated to allow smallholder farmers in Malawi improve their livelihoods. So this is what has brought me to Cornell to get uh, oriented in the debate about GMOs and how they can be applied in a setting as one that we have in Malawi. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Suleiman Usman Saudi. I am from Nigeria. I'm an agricultural extension communicator working with the National Agricultural Extension and Research and Services, uh, an institution in the Ahmad Bello University, Zaria. Uh, like you know, Nigeria is the largest and most populous country in Africa, and as such, uh, we have farming as our main background, even though oil advent uh, made us to pursue and neg neglect agriculture, but now, the administration is pursuing agricultural endeavor so that there will be the uh, back to glory of the country's uh, economy. And uh, that is why being uh, an agricultural extension uh, communicator, I take interest in uh, following up with the Cornell University here, the Alliance for Science, for the development of packages such that they can help Nigerian farmers in taking new innovations in agricultural enterprises. Thank you. So can everybody hear us? OK. So we'll, we'll, talk, we'll talk louder, and everybody will talk yes. very, the microphone up close. Can you hear me now? Yes. OK. So um, you've heard the three countries that are represented here. You've heard a little bit about their background, communicators, scientists. Um, what we're now going to do is I'm going to ask them a couple of questions, get a, lot, get a discussion going, and then um, at some point, we'll open it up for questions from, from everybody in the audience. So I guess since this is a, a panel entitled Facilitating the Global Dialogue on GMOs, I'm going to ask each of you if you could just briefly describe the di dialogue that's going on or the debate that's going on about GMOs in your own countries. Is it a positive debate? Is it a negative debate? Does it involve politicians? You know, who, who's involved and what exactly um, are they talking about? And, um, so people here have a flavor of what that debate is in your country. And why don't we start with Venezuela, and we'll move our way up. 
Over. Okay. Um, the dialogue in Venezuela is uh, very particular within in a position where uh, the, the official policy is uh, extremely anti-GMO and anti-biotechnology, and it has been that way for the last uh, 12 years or so. So even in school and uh, at universities and technical colleges, people are taught a lot of myths about uh, genetically modified organisms. So it is, a, it is a very difficult situation for people in our position trying to promote that fact-based conversation because even from, the, uh, from er an early age, uh, kids are being taught things that are just not correct. And uh, there is a seed law that bans completely uh, GMOs even for food consumption deportation, uh, the releasing of GMOs totally. And uh, there are a few politicians that are against this law. And uh, Agri the Federation of Agri Agricultural Producers is against this law. But no one will name GMOs, no one will say transgenicos, because it is an extremely controversial issue that has a lot of uh, negative uh, implications in the public opinion. So uh, the situation in Venezuela is very difficult because the opposition comes from the government, which is extremely strong. And as last week, we are pretty much in a dictatorship. Um, before we go on to Amanda, just one follow-up question. You said there's lots of myths or people from kids, even from young ages, are being told misinformation. Can you give the audience uh, one or two examples of, of some of the myths or what unscientific things are being said about GMOs? Okay. I'm in the position that uh, I was in my first year of college when uh, this position started. A uh, uh, field of uh, genetically modified papayas was burned. That was developed by scientists um, at my university in collaboration with Cornell. And uh, I was there when that campaign started, and it was just horrible. I was just a first year student, and I knew enough to know that these things were uh, completely false. Uh, we were told there were rumors that uh, the papayas had rat genes that caused the bubonic plague, that the pollen of the papayas will make uh, uh, pregnant women <coughs> give birth to children with uh, mental, uh, mentally retardation. Uh, we were told that uh, we will get cancer of multiple sclerosis. That was like the first batch of rumors. And then, since the government is uh, from the left, uh, the anti-corporate rumors started. So pretty much every single person that worked in molecular biology was a Monsanto shill. So there was no way to uh, have a productive dialogue since, uh, according to the other person, you're not honest just because you're a molecular biologist. Thanks. Amanda? Hello. Uh, as I earlier mentioned, I am from Malawi. To give a brief status of the current debate regarding GMOs in Malawi, I'd like to give a brief uh, background on how the debate may have commenced uh, during the years of 2001 to 2002. So following the agricultural season of 2000 and 2001, Malawi ended up in a food crisis where crop harvest declined and there were many people who were at risk of hunger. This spurred a lot of uh, debate on how to bring food aid to our country. And in the midst of all that aid that was flowing into the country, there was some, there was some food aid in corn from the United States government that was GM corn. This placed the government in a dilemma to regard whether they should accept this aid or neglect it because it was GM, because the government at the time did not have an enabling environment that stated how GMOs should be treated or whether Malawians should be consuming GMOs or not. So this eventually led to the establishment of the Biosafety Regulations Act that was released in 2002, which has 
eventually led to an enabling environment where biosafety regulations were also approved and the biosafety policy also approved eventually later in 2008. At the moment, there have been several field trials that have been conducted uh, on BT cotton and also BT cowpea, which are still underway. We do not have any GM product out on the market yet ready for release for people to grow, but these are crops that are being developed. I would say that uh, there has been huge endorsement for technology in agriculture. However, due to political uh, will willingness of key decision makers, sometimes the procedure is slowed down or sometimes uh, as easy going as it may be to come up with a genetically modified crop, uh, there is always some callback from key decision makers. However, there is an enabling environment for biotechnology in Malawi. So as a follow-up, would you say that is there a big anti-voice in Malawi from NGOs who are in the country? Is there influence from South Africa and NGOs there? Or are, are people sort of neutral or don't know a lot about this technology? Regarding the attitude towards GMOs, I would say there is some resistance from, some resistance from other organizations within Malawi who are working also in the agriculture sector. However, the debate has not been spurred up to such a point whereby individuals are even able to know what biotechnology really is or what it contains. So there is not as much awareness in the general public about what biotechnology is. So uh, I would state that as much as there is an anti-uprising, it, it hasn't reached its climax to even uh, spur any uh, dialogue, even with the general public on whether we should really definitely state our stance as far as biotechnology is concerned in Malawi. Thanks. Suleiman, why don't you tell us about Nigeria? Yes, uh, like uh, what my sister in Malawi just said, Nigeria is not an exemption. Uh, our farmers, in fact, in, along with the general public, have a very little awareness of what is called biotechnology, and even particularly the debate itself. But First of and foremost, you may be interested to know that the government itself has for long established an institution uh, called National uh, Agricultural Biotechnology Development Agency. So, and this one has been for quite a, a, a decade and a half now, has been in, in existence in the country. And also with the advent of the offer that's often fallen on the uh, biotechnology. So they are teaming up, uh, generating so uh, much research and other things within the country. But until just late, uh, last, late last year, when other, uh, the, the, the antis from other nations uh, teamed up together, so it erupted something like, okay, let us also start it in Nigeria. So a few groups, like the civil service group and uh, in fact some other religious groups also rose to say that, okay, they are against the biotechnology. But then it is important also for us to understand that in the Nigerian situation is so good for the farmers that they don't even care whether it is a biotechnology, whether it is this, whatever technology. They are interested in a very high yielding crop variety that may be resistant to pests, resistant to certain uh, particular diseases. Also, that can earn them more money, more social, uh, social and economic uh, uh, sustenance. As such, the issue of even saying that, okay, we are now fighting against the anti this, uh, I mean, fighting against the biotechnology is a technology that may uh, end up putting us into this and that uh, uh, problem does not even arise. Even though we cannot undermine the uh, activities of the anti You see, and uh, fortunately enough, the, uh, the biosafety law has just been passed into uh, the bill, has just been passed into the, by 2015. And the government has not said anything against it uh, for the meantime. And as such, even the government itself has been promoting the agricultural research and development for quite, for, I think, since 1922. An institute, in the, that, that is the Institute of Agricultural Research, based in Ahmad Bello University area, was established in 1922, particular research into agricultural uh, uh, crops. And for this, uh, of recent, they have just released uh, about 12 different varieties of maize. 
that have been developed, like the uh, quality pro uh, protein maize, the uh, drought tolerant maize, this and, uh, and uh, recently other maize, uh, water efficient maize for Africa. So all these things have been into research in Nigeria. And nobody even cares about what is biotechnology for the meantime, unless with this uh, uh, advent of the anti movement. And also that we are in a situation that if farmers can get enough seeds, and then the advantage, uh, this uh, the influx of being an African country, being the largest country also in Africa, and having the largest population of farmers even, the farmers have the right and access routes to get their own seeds from wherever because of the, some, some, sometimes the, 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 regu the regulation may not be such that they can not even know from the source of their, I mean their source of seeds. They said they can go out anywhere to get some seeds. Even though there are some, there is an agency, the National Seed Council in the country that regulates the good quality and the uh, quality of seeds that must be planted in the country, but yet farmers being very close, in, you know, Africa, like the West African nation, for instance, they can have access to Benin Republic, uh, the Burkina Faso, the Ghana, and other places where they can have other qualities that may improve their own uh, production. Can I just ask, um, just what to clarify so the audience understands. So can you tell me which genetically engineered crops are currently being tested? Uh, so Tamanda said it was BT cotton and BT cowpea in Malawi. Can you just tell us which crops, so everybody understands which crops are in the field testing stage at in Nigeria right now? Yes, uh, the Institute for Agricultural Research, in collaboration with the Open Forum for Agricultural Biotechnology, have uh, been the government even approved the confined trials of the Maruka beans, that is the insect resistant uh, Maruka insect uh, resistant uh, cow bean. Then the fortified sorghum also, along with the BT cotton, which is also under trial, confined trials. That is why I'm saying that uh, unless, except this, uh, if not because of this global uh, advocacy of the non uh, anti GMOs, otherwise Nigeria would have for long been accepting and taking the uh, genetically uh, modified crops for, for, for the farmers. So there are three, three crops that are being tested. Three crops, say? yes. Okay. Yes. Commander, do you have something you want to add? I just wanted to add that uh, as much as there has been other crops that are under development at the moment in Malawi, I stated that one challenge that the country faces as far as biotechnology is concerned is some resistance from key decision makers. This has rendered some other research that would have been highly beneficial to Malawi to be diverted into other countries or to only be conducted in other countries and not to be conducted in Malawi due to some delays or lack of political will in some instances. So that is what I wanted really to add. Okay. Yes. I might mention to the audience, for people who don't know, uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, there are only three countries now that grow commercial varieties of genetic engineered crops. That is Burkina Faso growing BT cotton, uh, so the Sudan growing BT cotton, and South Africa growing, growing some, uh, some genetic engineered maize, soybeans, and cotton. So just so you know, and we happen to have two of the countries here, Nigeria and Malawi, that are probably two of eight or nine countries that have really at least been willing to try this technology, that have had field trials um, that are actively have regulatory systems that are trying to address potential risks of, and, and scientists who are actually doing field trials. So we're pretty unique here. Um, most of the countries in Sub-Saharan Africa would not have any uh, field trials on GE crops and not be growing any GE crops. So these countries are sort of ahead of the game compared to others. Uh, but the question I want to ask, I know the Alliance for Science this year is really focusing on climate change. And I know I work in countries and in Indonesia is a particular country that's very concerned about climate change. And one of the strong arguments that politicians and, and scientists and others have made for the adoption of GM crops is to, to adapt to climate change. And so in Indonesia, they are uh, adopting GM crops as, a, as a one way to a deal with uh, global climate change. So I want to ask each of you uh, whether that argument or the, are there any discussions about climate change and how, if any, do those impact this debate about GMOs? Guido? Uh, I would say that no, in Venezuela, uh, it's not a, a matter of discussion of climate change. We're an oil producing country, and uh, the government seems to think that uh, uh, pumping more oil is the way to go, and <laughs> the alternative to more oil 
to divert our income is just uh, open air mining, which is extremely destructive for the environment, and we have some uh, very unique ecosystems in Venezuela that are going to be affected. Uh, these open mining activities have already been approved and should begin shortly. So biotechnology as an alternative to diversify our economy and to help our farmers that are struggling, even if we are ignoring the problem, is not even being considered again because we're making uh, policies based on ideology and dogma, not based on facts. I would like to firstly explain, uh, as I earlier mentioned, the majority of farmers in Malawi are smallholder farmers. On average, a smallholder farmer has to farm on less than an acre of land for their daily food for the entire year and also to make proceeds that will allow enough income for their households. As you know, most households, especially from where we come from in uh, Malawi, most households are extended families. As such, they have dependents of more than four or six. So this has definitely placed many smallholder farmers' households at risk of hunger. Over the past year, Malawi was at risk of hunger as such over 2.6 million were, uh, were needed food aid or food assistance in the year 2015 due to prolonged drought, dry spells, and also flooding. This has also been the same case this year, in the year 20, 2016, as many more people have been at risk of hunger due to the persistent droughts. So this creates a huge urgency for other alternatives that can be there to allow many farmers' households to be as productive as they can be in order to earn a stable income and also to have enough food in their homes. So I would like to also state that this has really called for any other action that may be there that will allow farmers to have access to seeds or any other technology that would be able to earn them enough income. Uh, as much as there has been dry spells or flooding, there has also been times whereby food aid will come or emergency aid will come in form of other alternative crops. However, usually these are delayed. If farmers are to even replant, the crops end up getting washed away or due to the uh, short rainfall patterns, not many of the crops end up performing very well. As such, I believe that uh, climate change definitely has spurred an urgent action together within the agriculture sector of Malawi for other alternatives that may be there to allow farmers and enough income in their households. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the Nigerian situation, I think, cannot be much different as an African country. Uh, the climate change is a phenomenon that uh, everybody has been given uh, uh, almost a, a lament, a enlightenment about. And uh, luckily enough, I can still, I will always say that uh, the country being a very large nation with variable uh, vegetations and different ecological uh, situations, the country has about six, uh, 17 agricultural research institutes. Each research institute is partaking research into agricultural Product, I mean agricultural crops, different from other research institutes. None is sharing anything to do with the other research, unless maybe collaborative efforts. Meaning that each of the institute has to come up with uh, correct varieties, right varieties that suit its own environment and the other environment within which it is established. And also all these crops that can be grown nationwide, for instance, a centralized research institute has been established to take care of such and uh, other crops. Uh, this, is, this means that, okay, the country has the potentials of agricultural research innovation that will suit its own environment. So climate change, as it comes in, has already made the country in the issue of maybe we are researching into, like, let me talk of the arid and semi-arid zones, where the ECRISAT, that's the International uh, uh, Crop uh, Research in uh, Africa, has has been based for quite for some time there. That it has a research to research into grains like uh, uh, millet and sorghum. 
Millet and sorghum are grown largely in the north. The north has very little rainfall, about 500 millimeters, uh, and, and, and even below sometimes. You see, so which means that, okay, they have enough varieties, I mean the, right, the correct varieties to suit their own environments. There were some cases, I mean some uh, localities within that uh, semi-arid zones that they don't even grow corn, that is maize. But then the search shows that, okay, now some varieties have been developed, like the extra early, early and extra early maize varieties have been developed. You see, all such varieties, like I mentioned earlier, may be gen genetically improved uh, varieties, but either genetically or genetically engineered or whatever, but their own traits have been improved, such that they will be able to take, I mean, the farmers can be able to crop such type of, 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 of grain and get more income for their family, I mean, for their family. Uh, also, if you look at the, for instance, the cassava, the cocoa, the other, uh, what do you call it, the, the vegetable crops, they have their own research instruments also. And as such, we are taking research into the appropriate seed varieties that will suit our ecological zone, despite any climate change. Even if the climate change is there, okay, the researchers are ready to uh, go by what can be uh, the phenomena that will suit their own environment. So I'm in a nutshell saying that Nigeria has already prepared and is ready also to uh, contribute its own quota to see that our farmers, the farmers in the nation, are taking the right varieties that will be enough to feed the nation, at least. Thanks. So um, this panel is about facilitating the global dialogue on GMOs, and I think we all, uh, those of us who work in these areas, are affected by that global, that global debate all the time, every day. And so my question to each of you is, um, you know, what do you think is needed to, to move that global debate into a better direction? Is it more scientific information? Is it better regulation? Or is it, is it political will by politicians and leaders? Is it, uh, is it just a, a crop that, far that farmers and people can look at and say, boy, that looks good? What, what do you think would help turn the debate in your countries uh, to a much more positive debate? I think all of those that you mentioned are needed, but uh, these, which will also be my closing remark considering the time, will be that uh, we need to shift the narrative because often the narrative is seen as uh, GMOs and biotechnology are colonialistic and all poor people from developing countries are being exploited. And often is activists from wealthy countries the one telling the story. And basically that's telling us that our scientists are stupid, our policymakers are stupid, that we cannot create our own GMOs. In Venezuela, we not only had these papayas, we had coffee, we had rice, we were working on potatoes, and all that research is gone. And this narrative is, as I said, is often made by activists that, as my brother Suleiman said, and my sister Kamala said, they go to these countries, and they talk to the governments, and then when the things get bad, they get out, as happened in Venezuela. One of the main activists uh, against GMOs and against modern agricultural methods was this British lady, university professor, and she's not in Britain. She's not uh, living in Venezuela, enduring the hunger, leaving the suffering that's happening right now. And things like that, she got out. And this is too common. These activists try to claim that uh, uh, biotechnology is paternalistic. What I would say is paternalistic is the belief that we are not smart enough to make our own research and to make our own decisions. And I think that this is an ingredient that uh, we have to add to all what you say. We need to shift the narrative and we need to raise our voices from our countries and say, you know what, we can develop this tech. We want this tech. We need this tech. We're going to use this tech. Thank you, Kido. I also want to agree with what Kido has stated. Uh, there is need to shift the narrative and also create awareness, just so general the general public is aware of what biotechnology is and what it entails. I also want to add that it is also important and very key to build and invest in partnerships with developing organizations or development organizations. A movement body of smallholder farmers 
has its own governing body and has the capacity to even bring out their voices and even be able to state their needs and what they are really interested in, what crops they are interested in having uh, innovation in. So I believe it is key that more partnerships are built and also bring the evidence to light, develop the technology that is there and at least also work towards making this technology available to everybody else who is in need of it around the world. Awareness has to be one key concept that I believe most bodies have to focus on at the moment. So I believe this is what can be done. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I think the Nigerian situation is such that uh, uh, we only need to team up with the uh, international uh, groups to enlighten our public, the farmers and the other, the general public of, uh, on the issue of the biotechnology itself. You see, if unfortunately we didn't start early and that the anti courage I mean, uh, vigorously campaign against it, it may be what uh, yeah, will be the first thing to go to the farmers and the general public and we can incite fear maybe to the uh, policy makers who may eventually come to say this or that. But then if uh, we tell the farmers and uh, that who they are interested in new varieties, I mean in, uh, high yielding varieties, resist, this is resistant, uh, resistant uh, first resistance, all this and that to make more income. So. We need to tell them that, okay, biotechnology is a substance that can, um, I mean, can increase their, their potential, not only in crops, but also in uh, animals and uh, such the, uh, to protect their environment because of the uh, economy and also other things. So you see, we only need to enlighten them from time to time and in the most uh, soonest uh, possible period so that there will not be uh, other groups that will come up to say that, okay, we are, not, we are now against it. You see, uh, the government uh, has signed the, this thing, uh, the, the bill, and no other potential threat except that of the uh, few ones I mentioned earlier. So if there is any vigorous campaign uh, that overshadowed the entire uh, movement, so I think we are freely uh, comfortable, we can be freely comfortable, and uh, the farmers can get uh, good access to the biotechnology that will improve their own livelihood. Okay. Now I'll open it up to some questions from the audience. So I'm going to walk around and because we only got two mics. Um, and what I'll do is take uh, three or four questions and then I'll go back to the panel to answer those questions so we can get a number of questions out. So how many of you can introduce yourself and you can answer your question. Okay. Uh, my name is Jonathan. I'm from the Biotech Institute of Technology. Uh, I'm going to ask you a question. Did I catch your name right? Guido, yes. Guido. Okay. Guido. Guido. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, the question from the moderator was, what myths was being taught in the school, not what myths were being spread by other people? I've been trying to put it into it. Well, it's, uh, let me ask for, can I take a, sure. I'm going to take a few questions sure, and then sure, go sure. back so we can get a, a, a number of questions on, on the table. Um, so, I'm To know why um, a lot of the discourse that was led, um, uh, a lot of the discourse that you heard here, though, um, came um, related to the fact that um, climate change is an issue that we need to increase people to in a lot of cases. However, um, I, I witnessed the time that in many African countries, those processes like testing and producing studies in the fossil or commercial processes like food processing are not related to that, like to My impression. Is that the strategy of the government is actually putting the farmers in a position of economic vulnerability towards the international market and depriving them of the security that they had previously? So, what is your opinion on this issue, and how do you feel that the global debate bank on GMO could be clarified and maybe made clearer um, if we try to reorient it on the state and on the motives behind GMO, not only on normative statements like convenience and food security, which is not always. Um, which is not always one of the objectives of the conference. Okay, I'm going to take two more questions and then I'll one here and one back there and then we'll ask the panel to answer. Hi, uh, I'm If I direct my question to my sister from Malawi. <coughs> so the topic of GMO is conversation, that's even among college educated university teachers. How do 
we have an informed dialogue about this topic among people who are the who are DNA ministers, not the ministers, with language is a barrier. We're talking about very complex science. How do we have an informed dialogue beyond propaganda that actually allows people to make decisions about it? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Joseph. My question goes to the African government. You know, it's a concerning thing that in Africa in particular, there's been a lot of things about who started not to come back. So maybe the child goes to a for example, to do some of them. The need for the introduction of that technology has been extremely positive. But the anti GMO campaign has always made a point that the problem with food security in Africa is not exactly a production problem, it's a problem about the public loss that is done after the production. Where do you draw the line? dealing with some of those concerns and this introducing a new technology like the GMO technology into the country right now. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to ask each of the panelists to answer the questions and try to be brief so we can go around with another round before we have to close. Right? Yeah, sure. I can tell you a little bit about exactly what's being spread on, sc on schools and technical colleges from their experience. Uh, none of my parents uh, finished high school until they were adults. I actually finished high school before they did. And uh, my father enrolled actually in, an, in a, the equivalent of a community college. And uh, he started a course in agriculture. He has a bit of land that he's trying to use now. That the situation is bad. And uh, every time that I Return. He actually got his own degree up a few years after I got mine. And he started asking me about these evil things that uh, were called transgenicos, GMOs, that were really bad because everyone knew that Monsanto just wanted to take ownership of all the seed and they will only allow people to, to plant what they wanted and these things will give you cancer. And he told me that that, that is what taught at his courses at the technical college. I have also um, talked to uh, high school students. And uh, when you talk to, like in uh, science fairs, where I, ha I have been demonstrating experiments in biotechnology, like a uh, very easy DNA extraction. And also these kids tell me that in classes they have uh, this kind of education. And uh, similar, like GMOs are evil, they will make you sick, they will make you ill, they will give you uh, diseases. And uh, I don't have it right now, but I can get you some material of that's being taught actually in, in the textbooks. There's a heavy indoctrination, and uh, it's no secret there has been uh, actual policy in the government to be against GMOs, and actually a part, uh, a big part of the popularity late Hugo Chavez, former president of Venezuela, with the anti-corporate left was his extreme opposition to genetically modified organisms, which even in the context of leftist uh, politics makes no sense because Cuba, Argentina, and Uruguay that were three big ally allies of Chavez all use GMOs, and Argentina and Cuba developed their own GMOs. So even from that point of view, it makes no sense that Venezuela is so irrationally opposed to GMOs. Thank you. Um, I would like to respond on how we can uh, create dialogue about biotechnology, especially uh, among groups that are not very familiar with the scientific context that is contained in biotechnology. And I think this is one of the programs that has usually been neglected. Science has been communi communicated by scientists and not basically by people who are able to even communicate in the most simplest language possible. So I believe these are one of the key things that the Alliance for Science is also working on in letting even people who do not have a science background be able to communicate science. I do not have a science background at all, but then I have worked with farmers and I am able to communicate agriculture to farmers. And I believe that this is another way that we as individuals need to definitely de 
uh, develop on. Let scientists speak to people who are not even scientists at all and let them have a way of dialogue in which both parties are able to understand in the simplest uh, language possible. I agree with you in most of the groups, even the smallholder farmers that I speak of, most of them have very low literacy levels. As such, it is difficult even to explain or even uh, educate on any agricultural terms or scientific uh, terms that are uh, included in uh, agriculture development in itself. Uh, most of them de uh, develop on indigenous knowledge and indigenous experience on how to grow or develop their crops. So I believe these are part of the programs that as individuals, I, as institutions, we definitely need to really highly concentrate and invest on. Thank you. Uh, and I also wanted to, uh, there was a question that was brought on um, about the dialogue that exists when, uh, as far as uh, low crop production is concerned. Uh, uh, there was a hand at the back. And uh, you mentioned that most of the losses happen during post-harvest handling or post-harvest managing of crops. But then uh, I believe, I have always actually always stated this, that biotechnology cannot be regarded as a magic bullet. But it is an innovation that really needs to be another alternative of which farmers can depend on. So I believe that even looking at crop production itself does not have to look at the crop production on its own uh, as far as planting on the ground is concerned. We need to develop and look at the holistic development of crop production, not just uh, growing of crops on its own, but also concentrate on how farmers are able to have um, enabling environments on which they can store their crops have enough knowledge on how to manage or handle their crops until they get to the markets. Even as far as they get to the markets, are these markets enabling for them to earn a stable and enough income to be able to provide for their households? So I believe we definitely need to focus on looking at all stages of crop development that are involved and not just planting of crops or not just uh, looking at how biotechnology can be made available. Once it's available, how do you allow farmers earn a stable and profitable income for their homes? Suleiman, if you're going to read, because yes. I want to try to get yes. other uh, questions asked. Let uh, me build upon what uh, she said regarding the post-harvest uh, handling of uh, agro. Actually, in the, especially in the Nigerian context, like you mentioned, the issue of uh, uh, crop production is not only that uh, mass production before harvest or this and that, but the post harvest uh, problem. You see, when you say you talk of post harvest, it means the issue of uh, maybe drying the crop, processing, uh, preservation, and storage. Likewise, the marketing aspect, which she started mentioning. You see, if farmers can have access market to their system for their crops, there will be no problem. But then, how do they handle the crop after or immediately after harvest? That's one of the major problems. Some farmers lose a lot of products right from the time of harvest. They harvest late. Sometimes they harvest at a different uh, environmental uh, uh, phenomenon, like the temperature will be unsuitable for even the, the, the drying of the crops. Yet they insist they have to uh, dry or spread it somewhere. Even the careless handling of the product after harvest is also uh, determines the price that farmer can fetch from this uh, product. As such, you see, it's an issue that if biotechnology, for instance, is, uh, like she, she, she mentioned, uh, she mentioned as an issue that can bring maybe new varieties developed, I mean, new uh, and improved varieties. Let me use the word improved. Improved means anything that can be above what a farmer may be used to get so that he can have more income for his uh, sustenance. If it is developed, then how does he handle it? Does the biotechnology also take care of the processing, the marketing, the this and that? So this is why I think she mentioned the holistic uh, issue in terms of uh, agricultural production. And also we need the economics. What economics? That is why most of our farmers, you see, they are being urged to, okay, you can sequence, I mean, or decide on when and how to produce, for instance, vegetables. There are some periods of scarcity of vegetables. And when it comes to the harvest of, like, tomato, uh, let me give a question of, a tomato this thing. Quickly, okay. very quickly, because I uh, want to ask another question. So uh, at I harvest, think you've answered the waste. A basket of tomato may sell 400 naira. That's in Nigerian context. Or well, let me say about uh, 
one dollar, for instance, a basket. Then there can be a period within the same year that that particular uh, particular uh, basket will be sold at about thirty dollars against one dollar at the harvest. So you see, and they have no other alternative to either preserve it or to process it other than just being uh, 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 left at the badge of uh, uh, exploiters in the market. Commander, I don't know if you had any comment on the Burkina Faso question. I know we don't have anybody here from Burkina Faso. So if you don't, that's fine. But I just wanted to ask whether you did. Um, of course, it was one of the first questions. So I uh, sort of uh, forgotten some of the uh, specifics of the question. But then I'll try to respond to that. Uh, choosing cotton as key crops that are being developed, crops such as cotton, you say, isn't it? I, I think I'll, 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 my only response can be that as farmers, obviously the key thing by the end of the day is they regard farming as a business. And farmers are able to, be, to take up farming as a business. So um, as far as cotton production is concerned, it does not mean that uh, investing in development of cotton should be the only way in which we get able to tell that farmers are able to have enough income in their homes. And what I mean to say is that cotton production on its own is taken up as a business. So through those means, farmers can be able to earn a stable income for in which they are able even to buy enough food for their households. Uh, Guido, but also has something to add on to that, so I'll let him. Yeah, very, very brief. Very briefly. <laughs> there are sorts of technical and regulatory issues. Uh, cotton is something that you don't eat, so it's often usually easier to get the approval. And also the BT trade has been used in many other plants. So by, uh, now it's fairly easy to do it in uh, cotton or across, as opposed to water res uh, uh, drought resistant uh, trades that are more difficult and still being developed. So I have time for like two more questions, so I'll, I'll ask you to make them brief, and maybe I can ask all three. I'm Melinda Martino, and I am a genetic engineer. I got the first uh, product to market back in 1994, the Flavor Bay tomato. And what I'm hearing um, is that income is a big concern, and on this cotton issue, uh, that was one of the problems. The country, uh, Burkina Faso, I think is not growing cotton anymore because the quality wasn't high enough in the farmers. Uh, so if income is an issue, the, the, this is a very expensive technology. And for countries to do it on their own and to go through the regulatory safety issues and all, um, that's, that's a big issue. So it seems to me that uh, comparing the, the expensive technology to other means of coming to the same, uh, you know, making your income via traditional uh, breeding methods could be an alternative. Uh, I also think that um, this idea that you're not eating the cotton, that's, that's a big issue. That the awareness, and, and it's not being accepted worldwide. In most places where these things are being grown in South America, uh, people aren't eating it. They're feeding it to their animals. So if you could just comment on these topics, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Very brief. I'm looking at the clock. We can try to be hard to end because there's a class coming. So I do have a question, but I just want to say, Belinda, you just asked that question. It's given a lecture tonight in Annabelle Taylor Hall at 7 p.m. in the upstairs auditorium. And it's part of an independent lecture series on GMOs that I'm running as a student at Quadrup. Do you have a question? Yeah. And I'm going to be passing out flyers if you don't want to Please, the question. Please, the question. The question is, um, essentially, I'm asking, are we pro-solution or pro-biotechnology? Because I'm aware of tons of traditionally prospect crops that do the exact same thing that GMOs are supposed to do, and they actually be a little better. This is drought tolerance, salt tolerance, yield increase, as both a traditional breeding method and an agroecological solution that you know, all the inputs and everything really make it work well. So, and a lot of these biotech crops, as Belinda mentioned, are failing. And I'm wondering, are we attached to biotechnology, or are we going to be focused on the solution that I actually are using? Thank you. Where the concerns 
Okay, so we're at 110. I'm told I've got to have this closed by 115 because <laughs> there's a class coming in. So I'm going to give each of you one minute to answer a question or give a final statement, and that's really all we have time for. Okay. Uh, I got a bunch of questions, so I'm trying going to try to make a global statement. First, uh, you got the technology is not that expensive uh, when you compare it to the economic damage that most of these problems do. Uh, if you have a failed uh, crop because of drought, the cost in human lives and in money can be tremendous. And uh, these, uh, we have a lot of new methods and we have improved the technology and the protocols. It's not the same situation that was 30 years ago. So I can tell you uh, the project we had in Venezuela had a very modest cost. And uh, so it can be done on a budget, especially in places like Venezuela where qualified labor is not as expensive as here in the States, for one thing. And uh, for another thing, uh, a lot of people in South America eat uh, genetically modified crops. It is simply not true that uh, we use it only for animal feeds, particularly in Venezuela. We don't use it, but in Argentina and in Colombia, our neighbors, they eat constantly genetically modified corn. Another thing, we are pro-solution. Of course we're pro-solution. We want simply to use every single tool we have available because our situation is desperate. We need every single tool. We don't have the luxury that people have here in the developed world. Say, oh, I don't want GMO. We need to use every single tool we have. Okay, thank you. Amanda? Um, we <laughs> I would also agree with uh, Guido. I'm also pro-solution. Uh, in most of my interaction with smallholder farmers, biotechnology is often asked about because even in their most un unprofessional affiliations or in the most casual ways, they're able to come across that uh, information and they're able to know that some other farmers in other countries are able to grow uh, improved crops and they ask about this. So in a simple statement, I can say that I am all about access. If the technology is there, why can't the farmers know about it? Once they know, I believe as individuals, we all have choices. I hugely, hugely believe that there's a need to shift our mindsets into, of course, looking at our resources and utilizing them to the best advantage possible. So if the technology is out there, why can't they know about it? Once they know, why can't they make a choice whether they should adopt it or not? Thank you. Thank uh, you very much. Uh, well, we've got one minute, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, Nigerian farmers need a technology that will boost their production. Uh, at least for them to break even, such that uh, a short uh, instance is that uh, a cow, a cattle flani farmer produces only four, four liters, at, not up to four liters of milk per day, his cow. And this cow is his own livelihood. He sells the milk and takes food with the uh, cost. And look at the present cow, for instance, giving about 30 liters per day. So a Nigerian farmer needs a technology. So that is why we need to communicate science to the farmers. And as such, that's why I want to call on the Conal Alliance for Science to encourage more of the regional dialogue and uh, regional uh, alliances such that we can globally handle the issues of our farming uh, technologies to raise up the uh, level of awareness and also to increase farmers' uh, productivity and their socioeconomic uh, potentials. So um, I, I'd like to thank the panelists uh, for coming here today, for being part of this discussion. I'd like to thank all of you for coming and, and listening to the discussion. I'm sorry if we didn't get to answer all the questions or uh, because of the time, but I hope that uh, this is the beginning of, again, facilitating a dialogue that I'm sure will, will not be over after today. Thank you. Thank you very much.